the christmas gift by horatio alger jr heavily heavily fell the snow covering the dark brown earth already hardened by the frost with a pure white covering as the rain falls alike upon the just and upon the unjust so too the snow god's kindred messenger knows no distinction of persons visiting all alike forgetting none and passing by none in one of the principal streets of new york stood a boy of some twelve years his clothing was poor and too scanty to afford a sufficient protection against the inclemency of the season through the visor of his cap which had become detached in the middle having a connection only at the two extremities might be seen his rich brown hair notwithstanding the drawback of his coarse and ill-fitting attire it was evident that he possessed a more than ordinary share of boyish beauty but just at present his brow is overcast with a shade of anxiety and his frame trembles with the cold from which he is so insufficiently shielded it is a handsome street that in which he is standing on either side he beholds the residences of those on whom fortune has showered her favours bright lights gleam from the parlour windows and shouts of mirth and laughter ring out upon the night all is joy and brightness and festivity within these palace homes the snowflakes fall idly against the window panes they cannot chill the hearts within nor place a bar upon their enjoyment for this is christmas eve long awaited at length arrived christmas eve around which so many youthful anticipations cluster has enjoyments peculiarly its own over which the elements however boisterous have no control yet to some christmas eve brings more sorrow than enjoyment serving only to heighten the contrast between present poverty and discomfort and past affluence but all this time we have left our little hero shivering in the street cold and uncomfortable as he was as well as anxious in mind for he had lost his way and knew not how to find it again he could not help forgetting his situation for the time in witnessing the scene which met his eye as for a moment he stood in front of a handsome residence on the south side of the street the curtains were drawn aside so that by supporting himself on the railing he had an unobstructed view of the scene within it was a spacious parlour furnished in a style elegant but not ostentatious in the centre of the apartment was a christmas tree brilliant with tapers which were gleaming from every branch and twig gifts of various kinds were hung upon the tree around which were gathered a group of three children respectively of eight six and four years the eldest was a winsome fairy with sparkling eyes and dancing feet the others were boys who were making the most of this rare opportunity of sitting up after nine o'clock at a little distance stood mr dinsmore and his wife gazing with unalloyed enjoyment at the happiness of their children while lizzie was indulging in expressions of delight at the superb wax doll which st nicholas had so generously provided her attention was for a moment drawn to the window through which she distinctly saw the figure of our hero who as we have said had in his eagerness raised himself upon the railing outside in order to obtain a better view she uttered an exclamation of surprise why mother there's a boy looking in at the window just look at him mrs dinsmore looked in the direction indicated and saw the little boy without his perceiving that attention had been drawn towards him some poor boy she remarked to her husband in a compassionate tone who loses for a moment the sensation of his own discomfort in witnessing our happiness see how eagerly he looks at the tree which no doubt appears like something marvellous to him why can't we let him in asked lizzie eagerly he must be very cold out there with the snowflakes falling upon him perhaps he would like to have a nearer view of our tree very well and kindly thought of my little girl said mr dinsmore placing his hand for a moment upon her clustering locks i will follow your suggestion 
but i must do it carefully or he may be frightened and run away before he knows what are our intentions so speaking mr dinsmore moved cautiously to the front door and opened it suddenly the boy startled by the sound turned toward mr dinsmore with a frightened air as if fearing that he would be suspected of some improper motive indeed sir said he earnestly i didn't mean any harm but it looked so bright and cheerful inside that i couldn't help looking in you have done nothing wrong my boy said mr dinsmore kindly but you must be cold here come in and you will have a chance to see more comfortably than you do now the boy looked a little doubtful for to him neglected as he had been by the rich and prosperous all his life it was very difficult to imagine that he was actually invited to enter the imposing mansion before him as a guest perhaps mr dinsmore divined his doubts for he continued come you must not refuse the invitation there are some little people inside who would be very disappointed if you should since it was they who commissioned me to invite you i am sure sir i am very much obliged both to them and to you said the boy gratefully advancing towards mr dinsmore of whom he had lost whatever little distrust he had at first felt a moment afterwards and the boy stepped within the spacious parlour to him whose home offered no attractions and few comforts the scene spread before him might well seem a scene of enchantment lizzie said mr dinsmore come forward and welcome your guest i would introduce him to you but unluckily i do not know his name my name is willie willie grant was the boy's reply then willie grant this is miss lizzie dinsmore who is i am sure glad to see you since it was at her request that i invited you to enter willie raised his eyes timidly and bent them for a moment on the singularly beautiful child who had come forward and frankly placed her hand in his there is something irresistible in the witchery of beauty and willie felt a warm glow crimsoning his cheeks as for a moment forgetful of everything else he bent his eyes earnestly upon lizzie then another feeling came over him and with a look of shame at his scanty and ill-fitting garments he dropped her hand and involuntarily shrank back as if seeking to screen them from sight perceiving the movement and guessing its cause mr dinsmore with a view to dissipate these feelings led forward harry and charlie the younger boys and told them to make acquaintance with willie with loud shouts of delight they displayed the various gifts which st nicholas had brought them and challenged his admiration everything was new to willie his childhood had not been smiled upon by fortune and the costly toys which the boys exhibited elicited quite as much admiration as they could desire occupied in this way his constraint gradually wore off to such a degree that he assisted charlie and harry in trying their new toys soon however the recollection that it was growing late and that he had yet to find his way home came to him and taking his old hat he said to mr dinsmore in an embarrassed manner my mother will be expecting me home and i should already have been there but that i lost my way and happened to look in at your window and you were so kind as to let me come in where does your mother live my little fellow asked mr dinsmore on blank street oh that is not far off i will myself show you the way if you will remain a few minutes longer mr dinsmore rang the bell and ordered a plate of cake and apples as he conjectured they would not be unacceptable to his little visitor meanwhile lizzie crept to her mother's side and whispered willie is poor isn't he yes what makes you ask i thought he must be because his clothes look so thin and patched don't you think he would like a christmas present mother yes my darling have you anything to give him i thought mother perhaps you would let me give him my five dollar gold piece i think that would be better than any playthings may i give it oh yes my child if you are really willing but are you quite sure that you would not regret it afterwards yes mother 
and lizzie ran lightly to the little box where she kept her treasure quickly brought it forth and placed it in willie's hand this is your christmas present said she gaily willie looked surprised do you mean it for me he asked in a half bewildered tone yes if you like it oh i thank you very much for your kindness said willie earnestly and i will always remember it there was something in the boy's earnest tone which lizzie felt was an ample recompense for the little sacrifice she had made mr dinsmore fulfilled his promise and walked with willie as far as the street in which he lived when feeling sure that he could no longer mistake his way he left him mr dinsmore whom we have introduced to our readers was a prosperous merchant and counted his wealth by hundreds of thousands fortunately his disposition was liberal and he made the poor sharers with him in the gifts which fortune had so liberally showered upon him notwithstanding the good use which he made of his wealth he was fated to experience reverses resulting not from his own mismanagement but from a general commercial panic which all at once involved in ruin many whose fortunes were large and whose credit was long established in a word mr dinsmore failed eleven years had rolled by since the christmas night in which our story opens lizzie had not belied the promise of her girlhood but had developed into a radiantly beautiful girl already her hand had been sought in marriage but as yet she had seen no one on whom she could look with that affection without which marriage would be a mockery charlie and harry too eleven years had changed them not a little the boys of four and six had become fine manly youths of fifteen and seventeen the eldest had entered college harry however who was by no means studious had entered his father's counting-room that was a sorrowful night on which mr dinsmore made known to his afflicted wife the bankruptcy which was inevitable still sadder if possible was the sale which it enforced of the house which they had so long occupied the furniture which had become endeared to them by memory and association and the harsh interruption which loss of fortune put to all their treasured schemes my poor boy said mrs dinsmore sorrowfully as she placed her hand caressingly on the brown locks of charlie the eldest of the two boys it will be a hard sacrifice for you to leave the studies to which you are so much attached and enter a store as you will be obliged to do oh, i'd not thought of that murmured charlie it will indeed be a sacrifice but mother i would not care for that if you could only be spared the trials to which you will be exposed from poverty thank you for your consideration my child but do not fear that i shall not accommodate myself to it it is a heavy trial but we must try to think that it will ultimately eventuate in our good at the auction of mr dinsmore's house and furniture the whole property without exception was knocked off to a young man who seemed apparently of twenty-two or three years of age he was able to secure it at a price much beneath its real value for times were hard and money scarce so that he had but few competitors mr dinsmore did not hear his name and the pressure of sad thoughts prevented his making the inquiry possession was to be given in one week meanwhile mr dinsmore sought out a small house in an obscure part of the town which in point of elegance and convenience formed a complete contrast to the one he had formerly occupied he felt however that it would be all his scanty salary as clerk for he had secured a situation in that capacity would enable him to afford lizzie looked with a rueful face at the piano as a dear friend from whom she must henceforth be separated it being quite too costly a piece of furniture to be retained in their reduced circumstances her proficiency in music for which she had a great taste made her regret it doubly since she might with it have added to the resources of the family by giving music lessons on the last evening in which they were to remain in the old house 
their sad thoughts were broken in upon by a ring at the bell can they not even leave us to enjoy the last evening in quiet said charles half petulantly immediately afterwards there entered a young man in whom mr dinsmore recognized the purchaser of the house i need not bid you welcome said he smiling faintly since you have a better right here now than i myself had i been told three months since that this would be i would not have believed it but we cannot always foresee i shall be prepared to leave to-morrow i shall be better satisfied if you will remain said the young man bowing what do you mean simply that as this house and furniture are now mine to do with as i like i choose to restore you the latter and offer you the use of the former rent free as long as you choose to occupy it well, who then are you asked mr dinsmore in increasing surprise who can be so kind to utter strangers with no claim upon you you are mistaken you have a claim upon me shall i tell you what it is eleven years ago to-morrow for to-morrow is christmas day a poor boy who had known none of the luxuries and but few of the comforts of life stood in this street his mind was ill at ease for he had lost his way but as he walked on he beheld a blaze of light issuing from a window from your window and aroused by curiosity he looked in around a christmas tree brilliant with light a happy group were assembled as he stood gazing in he heard the front door open and a gentleman came out and kindly invited him to enter he did so and the words of kindness and the christmas gift with which he departed have not yet left his remembrance seven years passed and the boy's fortune changed an uncle long supposed to be dead found him out and when he actually died left him the heir of a large amount of wealth need i say that i am that boy and that my name is willie grant the reader's imagination can easily supply the rest provided with capital by his young friend mr dinsmore again embarked in business and this time nothing occurred to check his prosperity charlie did not leave college nor did lizzie lose her piano she gained a husband however and had no reason to regret the train of events which issued from her christmas gift end of the christmas gift by horatio alger jr bertha's christmas vision by horatio alger jr it was the night before christmas snow was falling without and the wind dashed the cold flakes in eddying whirls into the faces of those wayfarers whom business or pleasure kept out thus late they drew their warm garments more closely about them and hurried onward little heeding the pelting of the storm while the vision of a cheerful hearth and a merry family circle danced before their eyes and warmed their hearts mary st nicholas too the patron saint of children was abroad it was a busy night with him thousands of parcels must be made up and showered down as many chimneys into expectant stockings before the morrow's dawn so he gives the rein to his coursers and speeds swiftly along through forest and brake through deep drifting snow over river and lake over hill over dale where the keen northern blast with fierce angry moaning drives fearfully past in a large and pleasant room sat little bertha gazing thoughtfully into the fire the fire crackled and burned and shadows cast by its flickering light danced on the wall but little bertha's thoughts were far away and she heeded them not for many weeks she had been looking forward to this very night and now she was trying to conjecture what gifts good saint nicholas had in store for her at length she grew weary of conjecture and took a lamp from the table and went upstairs to bed it was a neat little chamber and the counterpane on bertha's bed rivalled in whiteness the falling snow without bertha looked out of the window against the panes of which the snow was beating noisily oh it is a cold night 
thought she st nicholas will have a hard time of it what if he should not come at all bertha's apprehensions were soon dispelled for as she looked out the sound of silvery bells came nearer and nearer till at length it paused under her window and a moment afterwards was heard in an opposite direction bertha rubbed her eyes and strove to distinguish the sleigh from which these sounds proceeded but she could distinguish nothing can it be st nicholas thought she even as she spoke mingling with the sound of the retreating bells she thought she could distinguish the words of a song she listened attentively and these were the words which the wind bore to her the path i have chosen is covered with snow the streams are all frozen yet onward i go i glide o'er the mountain and skim o'er the lea i pass by the fountain yet no eye can see my form or my shadow on snowdrift or mound on hilltop or meadow or frost spangled ground while sleigh bells are ringing upon the highway and glad parties singing so thoughtless and gay i pass through and over each hamlet and hall ere mortals discover who gave them a call i pause but to count o'er the gifts for each one and then quickly mount o'er the stile i am gone that must certainly be santa claus thought bertha so she carefully hung up her stockings before the fire and went to bed she soon became tired of waiting for st nicholas to come and in a few minutes she was asleep but the thoughts of christmas had taken fast hold of her mind and as she slept shaped themselves into the following dream she thought that as she was lying awake in her chamber there appeared suddenly before her three figures clad in white slowly they advanced hand in hand until they stood before her bedside then with united voices they chanted the following lines maiden from the fields of air we have winged our rapid flight bringing gifts both rich and rare on this frosty christmas night guard them ever they will be of exceeding worth to thee they ceased and bertha in great astonishment inquired what are you st nicholas or she added recollecting herself perhaps you are his sisters the visitors resumed their chant maiden no thy christmas saint beareth gifts of mortal taint at the touch of sure decay they will vanish quite away those we bear are not of earth theirs has been a higher birth the visitors ceased and one of their number coming forward commenced anew i am faith to thee i bear childlike trust and confidence in the ever watchful care of our father's providence maiden one of sisters three this the gift i bear to thee the second came forward and repeated i am hope when darksome clouds gather round thy earthly way and misfortune's shadowy veil intercepts the light of day i will come on wings of light clouds and mist shall straightway fly and reveal the golden gates of a happier home on high maiden one of sisters three this the gift i bear to thee smiling graciously on the wondering bertha hope drew back and gave place to her sister who commenced as follows i am charity let me ever on thy steps attend and as long as life shall last be thy counsellor and friend in thy bosom i would sow seeds of gentleness and love and a resident of earth fit thee for a home above maiden and last of sisters three this the gift i bear to thee again the sisters joined hands and with united voices chanted as at first maiden from the fields of air we have winged our rapid flight bringing gifts both rich and rare on this frosty christmas night faith and hope and charity earthly maiden sisters three these the gifts we bear to thee their voices died away and they were gone bertha opened her eyes and lo it was all a vision that had come to her on this christmas night the morning sun was shining brightly through the window panes 
noisily over the frozen snow dashed the sleighs and their bells rang a merry peal in honor of christmas day bertha glanced at the well-filled stockings that hung in front of the fire and then she knew that st nicholas had been there with his budget of gifts and the words sung by the sisters came into her mind maiden no thy christmas saint beareth gifts of mortal taint those we bear are not of earth theirs has been a higher birth i will not forget the gifts of the good sisters she murmured softly doubtless it is my heavenly father who has sent them to me so it was that little bertha attended by the three sisters walked peacefully and happily through life the ways of god's providence so dark and mysterious to many became plain and clear to her for she saw with the eye of faith clouds sometimes gathered around her path but hope waved her wand and they were at once dispelled jealousy and envy and angry thoughts disturbed her not for her heart was filled with a heavenly spirit of charity would that we all might be blessed with bertha's christmas vision end of bertha's christmas vision by horatio alger jr the december surprise the telephone santa claus by patton beard the december surprise of course you know as well as dotty that there was a pen wiper in the first christmas pocket the writing on that pocket said not to be opened till after you have seen all your presents from the christmas tree on christmas eve marjorie liked the pen wiper ever so much she said that it could be used at school it was made of round red circles of cloth and had a button sewed at its center the story pocket was quite bulky and it said open on christmas eve for a bedtime story marjorie read it aloud as she and dot curled up in a big cozy comfortable at bedtime they had to have a very special dispensation from mother she said that the surprise book story that came on christmas eve might keep the bedtime light lit till it was finished so marjorie read aloud the telephone santa claus the shops were full of christmas toys there were christmas greens and fir trees everywhere big ribbon trimmed holly wreaths began to appear in front windows and everybody in the streets carried christmas bundles at this time too mary louise who lived in a large and beautiful house with mother and daddy and who was the only little girl they had began to plan what she should ask santa claus to bring her can anybody ever have too many toys mary louise had a whole toy closet full there were certain very best toys put by nurse on the top shelf for special occasions and there were countless everyday toys some of them a bit broken but a great many of them quite whole and splendid ever so much nicer than the toys that mary louise's little friends had to play with still mary louise wanted more toys the list that she now was writing in her round, wiggly handwriting had already covered several sheets of large pad paper that nurse had given her. Mary Louise sat at the big flat desk in the library. Her velvet dress was almost lost in the big armchair that was Daddy's favorite. Behind her was a cheerful fire in the hearth, and it snapped and crackled joyously mary louise's blue eyes traveled about the room as if seeking fresh inspiration in the objects that they rested upon she already had everything but she wanted more and so she put the pencil on the paper and continued the letter to santa claus i want two new teddy bears the biggest you have santa claus the pencil said i want one that is pure white like snow and another that is furry and brown both should have a squeak and if you have any that will growl i'd like that kind too i want a white doll carriage lined with pink satin they have them at bunty's department store for i saw them once and they cost twenty-five dollars i want a big doll to go in it i want a whole wardrobe of clothes for it a new doll cradle and it must have a pink silk dress too i want a doll that will open and shut its eyes one with real hair it must talk too 
you can bring me beside this a boy doll with a sled and all the different kinds of clothes that a little boy ought to wear i want a real toy automobile with a horn and a lamp not the kind that is like a tricycle because i already have one like that i mean the real kind that runs with gasoline they cost a hundred and twenty five dollars maybe a little more but i don't think you mind what they cost i want a doll house that is nicer than the one you gave me before it ought to be big enough for me to go into myself and i would like to have it built in the garden like a real house you can put it down by the greenhouses because it will be too big to bring into our house or carry down the chimney i know and then too i want mary louise's blue eyes considered the ceiling for a space of time i want a ring like mother's one with a blue stone in it she added while she was trying to think of something else to ask for the door of the library opened and in walked mary louise's big daddy he glanced for a minute at mary louise and he took up the telephone mary louise's daddy was busy there several minutes he watched mary louise nibbling the end of her pencil and he looked over her shoulder at the letter as he did so a smile crossed his face writing to santa claus mary louise he asked when he put down the receiver i was wondering what to ask for next mary louise informed him i think i'll ask for another pony nibbles is very nice of course but i'd rather like one that will trot faster i think i'd like a white pony with a white kid harness and a white basket cart you're asking for a great many things aren't you daddy suggested maybe it might be well to close the letter now i'll take it with me and mail it on the way downtown better address the envelope i might think of something more remonstrated mary louise but she folded the six sheets of pad paper and put them into the envelope that daddy held out then she addressed it to mr santa claus santa claus land santa claus country north pole exactly as nurse had told her daddy put it into his overcoat pocket as mary louise had seen him put letters that he posted for mother then as the library door closed she plumped herself down upon the thick black fur rug in front of the fire to look at a picture book she had not been there very long when the telephone bell rang james didn't come as he ought and marie was upstairs so mary louise incommoded herself by getting up from the rug to answer it it had already rung three times and she was quite ready to scold marie for not answering it but she did not have the chance as marie still did not come so mary louise took up the receiver hello she called hello came a cheery answer what is it inquired mary louise i want to talk to miss mary louise snow came the answer i'm santa claus oh i'm her gasped mary louise i'm i'm her never before had santa claus called mary louise up by telephone never had she spoken to him except for a few brief minutes at a christmas party celebration you are returned the voice well i'm glad you are at home mary louise there's something very special that i want to talk about it's almost time for me to receive your usual christmas letter i suppose there are a great many things that you will want have you been a good little girl this year oh, sometimes mary louise faltered i have tried very hard not to have tantrums maybe i did once or twice but i tried not to say things when marie would unsnarl my hair have you learned your multiplication tables up to sevens answered mary louise i think i can say them but i can't always remember what seven times nine is and i forget seven times twelve that sounds as if you had tried fairly well the voice of santa claus commented there are a great many christmas presents that you would like i suppose oh yes returned mary louise oh yes santa claus i just wrote you my letter and i hadn't quite finished it when daddy came in and took it to mail so maybe i'll write another later on i didn't ask for any games or things i might send another letter when i think of what i want if you like i will tell you the things that i asked for in my first letter if i can remember them i want a big big doll that can talk and it must have real hair and shut and open its eyes and it must have blue eyes and real eyelashes too 
i asked for a pink silk dress and gloves i think i can't remember and there were two big teddy bears with a growl and a squeak both very big bears one pure white and the other furry and brown i want a white pony too and a white cart and harness the letter will tell you all about that i forget all that i said in the letter she explained it was most six pages long of big pad paper oh, that was rather long chuckled santa claus yes smiled mary louise but i think i forgot to say that i wanted gloves for the doll i'm not sure i can bring the gloves santa claus said i think however that i might get the doll to you would you rather have a doll than the two teddy bears i want both replied mary louise it seems strange that santa claus should not understand a thing as simple as that teddy bears are very popular i know but i guess you must have ever so many and you've usually brought me nicer things than you've given other little girls that i know well maybe i can bring a teddy bear if there's one left over mary louise but i'm not at all sure i can bring the pony this year you know i'm afraid i've got to cut down on your presence mary louise that's why i called up i have something very very important to ask you i want to know if you can help me i'm trying to distribute my gifts more more properly this year you know of course mary louise that there are ever so many little children that do not get christmas presents especially in war time are there inquired mary louise i suppose it's the children who have been naughty oh no what is it then it's not because i forget them or because they are naughty explained santa claus's voice it's because too many goodies go to the rich little children then the poor little children who would like toys they have nothing oh gasped mary louise then i suppose you've given me more than my share i'm afraid so answered santa don't the poor children have anything sometimes i've given to the wrong people came the evasive answer you see i have a great deal to do i ought to have a lot of people to help me how can one person do it all sometimes i don't find the right children and i use up the things that grow in the santa claus land and then i have nothing left after the long long lists are made up for the very particular little rich children oh dear yes that's why do you want to give up some of your things this year so that they can go to the poor children mary louise reflected which she asked do you mean the doll or the pony or the automobile or the new doll house you have about a hundred dolls haven't you no corrected mary louise only just seventy-six counting the little bits of china ones in the doll house without these there are about forty but only twenty are big ones well chuckled santa claus that seems to me a good deal too many you could give up the doll i think suppose that you were a little girl who had never had any doll ever well but i'd like the pink doll i'll tell you what santa claus suggested you think things over maybe i'll find that i can spare a pink doll for you after all but i want you to help me look out for some of the poor children this year and i want you to buy at least six presents out of your very own money i want you to find some children that i ought to know about i want you to help them for me i'll telephone you some addresses where there are poor children and you must write these down and keep them and see that the boys and girls have proper christmas presents will you do it oh yes mr santa claus gladly returned mary louise i have nineteen dollars in the bank i think my daddy will help me no i don't want your daddy to help you it's to be your very own money all right i'll not ask him of course i want to help you mr santa claus i'd love to do it well good-bye if i can i'll come on christmas eve to your tree you do the very best you can mary louise and invite the poor children to share your tree the receiver was hung up at the other end of the line and mary louise stood bewildered before the library table where she had just written her long christmas list she stood there thinking it all over from beginning to end she she had been asked to help santa claus it was a great distinction 
poor overworked santa claus had appealed to her as a very rich little girl who already had everything and she mightn't get the pink doll at all then mary louise could not keep the secret any longer and she dashed up the stairs to mother's room she wouldn't let mother go out of the room till she had told her the whole story and mother had a very important engagement and was all ready to go out in the car together they emptied mary louise's bank and counted out exactly nineteen dollars and fifty three cents mary louise wanted to take it and start right out in the car to buy the presents but with difficulty mother explained that she had better wait till santa claus sent in the names and she had found out what the children wanted and santa claus did telephone the names mary louise was at dinner and james answered the telephone mary louise felt badly that she had not been called but there was no need to take her away from dinner james had the addresses on the telephone pad mother said she was sure they were right mary louise wished daddy were home it seemed to her that he would never come as she felt sure she would need to buy a tree for the christmas party she got nurse to take her to that shop in the afternoon but it is wonderful to think that a christmas tree costs money before this mary louise had never considered the subject it was a very tall tree and it was an expensive tree the charge for it ate into the nineteen dollars and fifty three cents considerably the things that went on to the tree must all be new santa claus must see that mary louise had bought new ones to please him so she bought ever so many stars and birds and balls of red yellow blue green white silver gold and there was need of tinsel if mary louise had had her own way she would have spent almost all the nineteen dollars and fifty three cents just on that tree without thinking of the consequences why if she had how could she have bought any presents for the poor children next day after having told daddy all about it she wrote to the addresses that santa claus had given her she wrote the letters in ink and used her very bestest best blue note paper all the letters were sealed with a santa claus sticker it did take a great deal of time i assure you the invitations were to mamie and johnny and toby smith they were to tony patino and lily wicks and benny wicks who lived in a part of the city mary louise had never seen nurse said it was a very sad part of the city when mary louise asked if she might go there and see it and see the children nurse said she guessed santa claus didn't know what he was talking about she guessed not mary louise insisted but all in vain santa claus had told her what the children's ages were and left the gifts to mary louise's selection when daddy had taken the letters to the poor children in his overcoat pocket to mail mary louise fell to planning about the gifts only one little girl all boys how dreadful but mother helped mary louise by suggesting things that little boys might like from her own playthings mary louise selected her biggest doll for lily and would have given her ever so many other dolls had not mother thought that mary louise might add other little girls to her christmas list of poor children and make the helping of santa claus more equally distributed among those who might otherwise be forgotten how fast the nineteen dollars and fifty-three cents did go just buying the tree and the fixings and the sled and the overcoat and mittens and skates and carts and baseball bats it was a tragic moment when mary louise suddenly discovered that benny had been neglected and didn't have as many gifts as the others she consulted daddy as there were no boys toys among her playthings and nothing seemed right daddy said well he said she might work and earn the money to buy benny a present never in her life had mary louise worked to earn money how can i earn money she asked daddy thought if you will learn the seven times seven table and the eight and nine and any of the others i'll give you a dollar for every one you can say perfectly that's very special mary louise because it's christmas you know 
dear me to think of having to sit down quietly in all the excitement of christmas rush and learn horrid multiplication tables if anything was work that surely was but where there's a will there's a way and mary louise did it she did it so well that she remembered all of the seven table perfectly she also went on and learned the eight and nine tables and the ten table that was easy then being quite enthusiastic she tried hard at the others and mastered the twelve table after keeping at it a steady day with the proceeds of these earnings paid gravely by daddy she was able to buy benny a game and when she went to buy it and found some little poor children right by the car that stopped at the entrance of bunty's department store she was able to invite them then and there and go right in and buy presents for them they needed woolen scarves and mittens and mary louise had found presents on the toy shelf among the toys kept for very special occasions these would do for them when once mary louise had started to help santa claus there was no knowing where it would end whenever she went out she saw little children whom she was sure santa claus had forgotten because they looked so wistfully in at shop windows some of them nurse let her speak to and she added these to her list for the party there seemed to be no table of thirteen to learn but daddy gave a dollar for every poem she could recite and mary louise knew ever so many and it was easy to learn short ones oh dear oh dear how the time did fly before mary louise knew it christmas eve was there there had been all the fun of fixing the tree and daddy and mother had helped mary louise hoped santa claus wouldn't disappoint her she hoped that he surely would come she was very much relieved when james came in and said that he had just been asked to deliver a message that came from santa claus over the telephone it was a telegram and it said will be at your christmas party christmas eve eight o'clock santa claus after that mary louise didn't worry she let marie take the tangles out of her hair and help her into her very best pink silk dress and then she dashed downstairs to wait for all the guests who had been invited to come she wanted to play games with them and she wanted to tell them all about santa claus and she hoped they would like to sing carols and dance around the tree but most of all she hoped that they would like the presents she had arranged for them at santa claus's suggestion oh wouldn't it be fun to see santa claus give out the big white teddy bear and the big brown fuzzy bear and the pink doll and the cart and the skates and and but here the doorbell rang and there was a scuffle of happy feet it was lily and benny and tony and all the rest they were as happy as happy could be mary louise greeted them all and then they beamed upon her almost as if she were santa claus herself but i just wish you could have heard the shrieks of delight when the front door bell rang and james ushered in santa claus himself it was just too bad that daddy wasn't there to see all the fun though mother did hope that maybe he might be able to come later oh what a good time they all did have it was the very best and happiest christmas that mary louise had ever 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 had it was wonderful why mary louise had such a good time that she forgot all about the pink doll till santa claus came and gave it to her after giving out all the other gifts it was the very doll that mary louise had wanted but she asked santa claus to be sure he could spare it and that he had neglected nobody else to give her the doll he said he guessed not at least he hoped not and then they sat on the sofa and ate ice cream together while santa claus joked and told stories but he couldn't stay very long he said and he had to go then just afterwards alas in came daddy who might have met santa claus if only he had got there a wee bit sooner and the children danced around the tree and sang carols and then they all wished mary louise a happy christmas and went home with arms laden with packages that they hugged tight and smiled and chuckled over after the children went there was just mother and daddy left 
they both kissed mary louise and vowed that they'd have another party again next year maybe then daddy took mary louise upon his knee and put a little blue ring upon her finger it was the kind of a ring that mary louise had wanted one just like mother's only little and mother told mary louise that her christmas present was the dollhouse it was coming as soon as possible it was so big that one could play inside and it was to be placed right close to the garden greenhouses it was a christmas that mary louise never forgot and couldn't forget even if it had not been for the blue ring and the multiplication tables end of the december surprise the telephone santa claus by patton beard